Bible, if you will, and turn to Galatians, the third chapter. And we're going to start reading at about the 27th verse. Before we read this 27th verse, I want to remind you of another verse of Scripture. It's in 1 Corinthians 12 and 13. It's the little verse that says the Holy Spirit, for by one Spirit, the Holy Spirit, we have all been baptized into one body. To paraphrase that, the Holy Spirit is the one who has placed us in Christ, in the one body. That doesn't mean that it is water that did that. It means that the Holy Spirit did that. And this 27th verse of Galatians 3 said, for as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Every one of you, the moment you were saved, were placed in Christ. You didn't know that. Nobody around you probably knew that. Because those around you, if you were in a church building were probably getting you to confess and repent and they wanted to hear the right words and uh, the fact that you was going to hold on and continue and not give up and all the things that religion would like. But you didn't know anything that was happening. But the moment you believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, you were placed in Christ. Amen. You never felt it wasn't anything to feel. It was a God thing. You know, most of the things God does, there's no commentary with it. There's no words given, no sounds. Thank God on the resurrection morning, there will be some sounds that take place. I'm, I've stopped looking for the Lord, and I'm listening for the sound now. Because that's the next thing that's going to happen. The next thing God's going to do to human beings is allow certain ones to hear those sounds, the sound of his coming. But the moment you were saved, you were placed in Christ. If I had a theme for what I'm talking about tonight, it would still be on the same subject. This subject is the gospel of daily living in Christ. There is probably as much written about this subject as any other subject Paul gives us. You notice I said Paul because there is no one else in this book that tells a human being how to live since the cross. No one. Peter didn't do it. He preached the Old Testament message that we're going to have a great revival. James didn't do it because he stayed under the law. Jude stayed under the law. John is the only one who did it, but he did it 30 years after Paul died. He didn't get it till then. Did you know that everyone living in that day had all of Paul's epistles before anything else was written since Malachi. Isn't that interesting? That was enough to blow my mind and say, well, boy, these Paul's message is the truth. He didn't have anything else. He is the only one who wrote scripture that was included in the volume. Now it is said that one of the gospel writers might have written his one gospel the year Paul died. But Paul's 
epistles were all available for humanity long before there was ever a gospel, long before there was any prophecy written, we had Paul's message. I would say that the heart of his message, the thing that really begins the flow of life in his message, talks about the first moment a human being has with God. The first moment that something really does take place. And that's 1 Corinthians 12 and 13. For the first thing happens to, that happens to you when you're born again is the Holy Spirit places you in Christ. The word baptized is used because it denotes immersion. It means that you were placed all the way under. You were placed completely in Christ, not partly, not some, not hopefully, not later on it'll come, not after you go through your inception into the denomination and take all of the lessons you have to take to be one of them. Instantly, you went completely into Christ. Nothing was left out. That's why the word baptized is you. That's a big word to us that have been Baptists, you know. The, the Baptists don't mess around with water. You put you all the way under or you're not going to get in the church. And I don't care how many times you've been baptized somewhere else to get in the Baptist church today, you're going to go all the way under again. That's why they're called Baptists. Total immersion. You see, everything God could give you was given to you at that moment you believed. Now, I'm no fool. Let's say it like this. I want you to remember it. I have no idea what God counts legally for you to be saved. <coughs> I don't know to what degree. I don't know what he determines. That he takes the whole bucket of grace. And pours it out on a believing sinner. I say that because I have a, met a lot of people who claim to be saved. you ever meet anybody that claimed to be saved? but you had no recognition from anything they did or said that would indicate anything. I don't judge them. Somebody tells me they're saved, I take them at their word. If they're lying, that's between them and God. They're fools if they do that. If they don't mean what they say, if they haven't had an experience with God but brag that they have, they're fools. That's real stupidity because you're dealing with eternity at that point. So I don't judge people. But I believe that the moment you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, He dumps the whole thing that has been bought and purchased for you on you at that instant. It all comes. We've got a few are going on now among evangelicals. An old teacher of mine, John MacArthur, has come up with an idea that I want everybody to, to legally tell me they're going to live for God before they get saved. He's tired of messing with people that don't appear to be saved. But that's a foolish thing. How can you know that? How could anybody prove that they're going to be something? That's God's work, not man's work. And man ought not to be touching it at all. Leave it to God. But you know what? When you were saved, God gave you everything that was bought and purchased at the cross. He left nothing out. As I told you earlier in the day, God never touched your brain. He never touched your mind. He left that 
for you to learn, to come to know, to seek the Lord. He left it to you because that's where your love affair is. The only love affair you make with God is in your soul. And so as Larry was talking tonight, I thought he explained it just right. Because in his process of knowing the Lord, he was led of the Spirit step by step. What was he getting? Something new from the Lord? No, it had been there all the time. But it had to be unlocked by the Holy Spirit. It had to be revealed by the Holy Spirit. That's where many of you are now in the Christ life. You're awaiting a revelation. When you have it, you'll tell us. You will tell us. When it is revealed to you that Christ lives in you, you'll tell it. People are always saying to me, I believe my preacher is preaching the same thing. There's one thing you listen for, and that's his moment of revelation. He needs to tell you that there is a difference in his life at some moment when Christ is revealed to him. The Apostle Paul proximately waited three years after he was saved before he had the revelation of Christ in him. And before he could ever preach it, uh, he may have gone ten more years. But he had Christ in him all the time. Why? There is no other salvation aside from Christ living in you. It's just a hard struggle people have trying to live a better life when they get saved or become a Christian, which works against them because you're not going to get a better life on your own. You're going to get it by something that's been bought and paid for by precious blood. So you were placed by the Holy Spirit into Christ. Every one of you in this room that's been born again have been in Christ. What I talk to you about tonight is living who you are. See, I'm not trying to put some new blessing on you. I've lived through the years, I've been preaching almost 60 years, and through those years I have seen a whole lot of things that come on. Most of them have passed on, thankfully. But I've seen a lot of things come on where somebody said, I've got a new blessing for you here. I've got a new experience for you. I've got a, a new gift for you. I've got something that if I can lay my hands on you, I can give you unbelievable things. Listen, the moment you believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, you received everything the cross could pay for. Because salvation is not controlled by preachers, not controlled by churches, not controlled by committees, and not controlled by you. You simply believe and God applies the works of the cross. What Jesus died and paid for is yours. It happens instantly. But you may live a lifetime and never find out about it all. Somebody says, what is Litzman doing? I'm not preaching anything new. There's so much scripture on this, I've never exhausted it myself. And I've read it again and again, but I didn't get it then. I didn't get it then. And I read it again, and I still don't get it. That's in God's timing. That's in God's hands. But I'll tell you, this thing that we call the Christ life belongs to every believer that's saved. Every one of them have Christ in them. Not a one of them. Listen to this. Not a single human being that's saved have more of Christ in them than you do. Why? Because salvation doesn't come on the basis of anything we do. It doesn't come on the basis of anything you think. If you have accepted Christ as your Savior, though you may be dumb as a doorknob, He gave it all to you, and your life is spent in a love affair finding these things, finding who you are, finding who He is, finding what this book says. That's the great thrill of Christianity, is this discovery. 
So the moment you were saved, you were baptized into Christ. I've had people come to me and say, well, have you been baptized by my preacher? You know, there's some that believe that you have to be baptized by their preacher in their baptistry under their conditions or you're not saved. Isn't it good we have a Bible? Have you credited God with a Bible any time lately? You ought to do it. It beats any instruction book you're ever going to get. And it's not hard to read. I mean, there'll be parts you don't understand because you're clogged, you're blocked in your own thinking, in your mind. But that's why the Holy Spirit comes. He's a part of that baptism into Christ. The Holy Spirit is yours at that moment. You don't have everything the Holy Spirit could give you, but you have the Holy Spirit himself who gives to you on the basis of hunger and desire Amen. and what you want. But he's there. He's there because Jesus said, I give you another comforter. So you're not without the Holy Spirit to help and to guide you, even now. But the Holy Spirit can't do anything unless he has some direction. What is his direction? The scriptures. I know this irks a certain group of people, but I want to tell you, I don't believe the Holy Spirit ever reveals anything beyond the scriptures. I've been in it long enough to believe that. I don't think that's his mission, to reveal external carnal things to us. I think his mission is basically to reveal Christ. That's what Jesus said. And I kind of take that literally because I've heard of so many revelations in my lifetime you wouldn't believe. Me. None of which worked out. You have the fullness of the Godhead. You have everything God could possibly give to you. And now if you love him, if there's a love affair between you and the Father, you're going to find out what those things are. A fellow said to me not long ago, why do people come to your meetings? There are better speakers, there are bigger crowds, there are there are uh, people who have a whole lot of money to record. I've never had enough money to get first-class equipment. You'd have to have a truck to carry it, but I, I'd like to have it wherever I went. But it doesn't slow me down. It doesn't hinder or hurt us. Because I got a message that makes a difference. Amen. His message makes a great difference. And so our text says in the 27th verse, as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Now, that's not something you wear. That's not. Oh, I'm really wired up here. That's not something that you can touch and feel. To put on Christ means to fix your mind to knowing nothing but Christ. Paul's greatest statement and confession of his life and of Christ was, I am determined to know nothing save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. When you get your life down to that point, you've arrived. At what have you arrived? You're ready now to know who you are. What in the world happened to you when you accepted Jesus as your Savior? You're not going to get saved at that moment, but you're going to feel like you got saved. I never will forget when I had a revelation of Christ. It was in uh, 1960. I never will forget I felt like I was saved for the first time. I knew I wasn't. I'd been saved and filled with the Holy Spirit and blessed of the Lord in many different ways. But I felt like when I had a revelation that Christ was my life, I was saved for the first time. What brought this feeling to me? For the first time, I felt like 
I was knowing who I was. I knew who I was. I knew I wasn't a German. I knew I wasn't a Litzman. I knew I wasn't just a, a boy. I knew I was a child of God and that Christ lived in me. I knew that. You put on Christ. He uses these terms in a couple of the scriptures. Clothed with Christ. Knowing nothing but Christ. That shouldn't be a strange thing. I could spend all my time telling you what's wrong with you. But I'd rather spend my time telling you what has already happened to you. I'd rather you come to know what God has done for you because you wasn't saved by the church. You wasn't saved by a committee. You wasn't saved by your own efforts. You were saved by God who chose you at that moment to be his bona fide offspring. Yes, amen. When you enter into that relationship, you're ready to live. The next verse says, in Christ, last line of verse 27, you put on Christ and there is neither Jew nor Greek. Now you've never, you've never come across this, have you? Have you ever at any time asked God to deliver you of being an Irishman or a Scotchman or a Mexican or an, uh, an African, or did you ever ask God to deliver you of those thoughts? Could that be something that is blocking you from knowing what all happened to you when you was baptized into Christ? See? Because there are no Germans in Christ. You've entered into a new race of people. In fact, in the Bible, there are only three races, Jew, Gentile, and the born again. And you neither Gentile nor Jew continue in life. You probably heard this on a tape somewhere back, way back. But I never will forget the day I first put that to work. I was uh, uh, waiting at the Denver Air Park. Uh, airport to go on into Dallas and so I was walking around looking at things and on one of the balconies uh, uh, this is the old Denver airport they had a, a Jewish Christian Jew display of things that had to do with Christianity and Judaism so I was there looking at it, thumbing through a book or something. I can't remember exactly what I was doing. And a little lady toddled up to me, and she said, Could I help you? And I said, Oh, no, I'm just looking if you don't mind. Well, she said, I really would like to help you if I could. Is there anything I could tell you or explain? I think she thought I was a Jew of some kind. <laughs> and we talked for just a few moments, and she said, Well, I sure would be glad to help you because... You really need to know the Lord and uh, to become one of us. And I looked at her and I said, uh, you say you're a Jewish Christian? Yes, that's what I am. I've accepted Jesus as my Savior. Why'd you ask? I said, there is no such thing as a Jewish Christian. There is no such thing. She said, oh, there is too. She got, she got upset with me right off. I said, in Christ, there are no Jews. You understand what happened to you when you got saved? You've never accosted that before. Because Italians especially like to get the family together. Mm -hmm. Me Mexicans are the same way they like to get all their families together and have a big program 
That's their family. That's good. No, no wrong and harm in that. But you can't celebrate your old life. You can't celebrate it. But we do because we don't know any difference. We don't even think there's any difference. But that's what hinders this gospel from spreading. Because you need to know that you've been placed in Christ and that in Christ you have become a new race of people. So I'm telling you how to live. I'm not telling you what you need to do. I'm telling you what you have already had to happen to you. I'm telling you who you are. Because that's what the world needs to see. The world needs to see a Christian that has Christ living in them. Not somebody that tells them what a Christian is, but lives it. That's the great thing that's happening to people that catch on to Paul's message is that they begin to live what they are. It comes out in their speech. It comes out in their thinking, in their mind. They are careful that they not violate who they are. They are not still an Irishman or a Greek or a Jew or a German. They are a new race of people in Christ. So there is neither anything left of the earthly now, I could pick on all of your earthly sins. I could tell you, you can't do this and be a Christian. But I had rather talk to you about what God has already done in you, and you become cognizant of it and begin to do something with it. What you already are. You see, you had nothing to do with becoming this person that you are in Christ. You're like a newborn babe. A newborn baby has nothing to do with anything that has to do with its birthing. Nothing. Somebody else does it. Somebody else is in charge. And it's some time before that little baby ever does anything for itself. It's not supposed to. It's supposed to be taken by some, tar- care of by some, somebody else. When you were born again, you had nothing to do with it. But now that you have been placed in Christ, and the message says Christ is your life, you need to learn about it. You need to study it. There's more than one of you in this room that studied your vocation, your family vocation. You studied it. There's more than one of you that studied your ethnicity. You studied the roots or the root of your family. But we didn't take any time to study who we were in Christ. And nobody around to help us. Don't come and tell me I just don't think I'm fully saved. People are doing that all the time. There's no such thing as part saved. (laughs) There's no such thing as partial birthing for Christians because the Holy Spirit's handling that. That's the work of God. He's taking care of the birthing because it's going to depend on your eternity. It's going to depend on His service through you. It's going to depend on how many souls will come to know God. It's going to depend on how much we tell the world about who God is. Everything depends on that moment whenever you accept Jesus as your Savior because God is depending on you to know who you are. And once you find out who you are, you won't be able to keep quiet about it. I don't have to spur these people on. You think, I, you think I'd have to tell Larry Philippe what he needs to do? No, sir. His eyes are wide open. Anybody he comes in contact with, he immediately measures. Are they or are they not? Is this or is it not? Can they or can they not? That's the way I deal with people. 
If it isn't the time, I can pass it on. But I've already evaluated it. If I see it isn't God's moment, I can go on. But I look at life from who I am. I'm one of God's offsprings and we need a few more. So there's neither Greek nor Jew in Christ. Now, let's follow that verse on, verse 28. There is neither bond nor free. Huh, how do you like that? That's not even male or female. Why? Because they're all one in Christ Jesus. I like what uh, David T. Garden said. Yeah, I guess it was David. Was it David? Anyhow, one of these speakers said that whenever the Lord s saved somebody, they became one with each other as well as one with the Lord. Where were they? John 17. David, was you in John 17? They're all one in Christ. Why didn't Jesus talk about these things? Why was it left to the Apostle Paul? How did it come to end up that Jesus of Nazareth taught very little, if any, of what the Apostle Paul taught? Worse than that. How is it that Paul didn't teach anything Jesus of Nazareth taught? Why? Why is it that Paul didn't take the things that Jesus of Nazareth did? He could have learned those. Those things could be learned by first hand, by people who live. By the very people Paul was trying to get rid of, they could have told him things about Jesus of Nazareth, what he said, what he preached. Paul could have picked it up, but he never picked up any of it. There are some lines that infer things that Jesus of Nazareth might have said, but he never preached a subject on it. Why? Why? Why didn't he preach Jesus of Nazareth? Because he had a different message than Jesus of Nazareth had. But that's not the main reason. It was because when Jesus went back to heaven as God's son, it was that Jesus who revealed to the Apostle Paul the new life in Christ. Saint Jesus You may have trouble with that. That Jesus of Nazareth was so different in his message than the message he gave to the Apostle Paul. But the facts are, his message as Jesus of Nazareth belonged to Israel. And he plainly said so. And when he left this earth, there was still in motion the fact that Israel could accept their Messiah and the kingdom could be restored. That was so for the next several years, up to the time that the Apostle Paul on the road to Damascus was saved. And even after Paul was saved, till Acts 28, 28, there was still an open door to the kingdom. But that wasn't the message that was to be given to those who were saved by the cross. The message of the kingdom belonged to people who lived on this earth as Jews, Judaism, or converted Jews who were a part of Abraham's lineage, who was a part of Moses' message, who was a part of the Old Testament. 
They were a God-called people and were appointed to certain destination, and they will get there. They're not there yet, but they will get to everything God pointed Israel to be and to become, and she will rule and reign on this earth. But God was ready now to set aside an earthly people and deal with the people who would come to live in heaven with him. How's he going to get these people? He's going to birth them himself. He can't be a father without an offspring, and he can't have a family until he brings them all together in the Father's house. And that's what's working. So Jesus made this statement. He made it a couple of times in different ways. And he said this to those he ministered to. There are a lot of things I'd like to tell you but I can't tell you now. There are things I'd like to say, but I can't say them to you now. You can't handle them. He said words like that in another place. You can't handle what it is I need to tell you. He was fixing so that the father could begin to birth his own family. But what did it all begin? What did it all center in? It centered in the cross. There had to be a cross before he could go any further. Because these people were going to be birthed by God and they could not be birthed by God unless he was true to himself. We are justified people. Thank God for justification. But God is justified to have his own family also. We are not only justified by what happened at the cross. God is justified by what happened at the cross so that he might have his own family. He paid the price. He legally bought the souls of humanity through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And any time anybody believes on the Lord Jesus Christ, they're not going to get some of that or part of that or hopefully have it to come in the next 30 days. They're going to be fully, completely, to its utter depth, saved by grace. That's what salvation is. And if anybody in this room tonight that's worried about your salvation... You're worried about the wrong thing. Don't worry about God's part. Your concern is being receptive. Receive the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and God has already taken care of the rest of it. It's simple. This business of being in Christ is very simple. God didn't save his family to be turned over to the devil like Adam and Eve. Christ didn't die on the cross so that we would all be tortured by the devil. There are a lot of people who preach that. We've got a whole lot of people who preach more devil than they do Jesus. <laughs> but that's not the scripture. The scripture is that we have been placed in Christ to its fullest extent. There's neither Jew nor Gentile And then it goes on to say there's neither bond nor free, male or female. They're all one in Christ Jesus. Notice, there is nothing in God's plan that is separated from in Christ's position. Nothing. If you don't understand this business of being in Christ, you'll never have the salvation you could enjoy, which you already have been given if you truthfully believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. So Jesus said, I have a lot of things to talk to you about, but you're not able to handle it right now. He's talking to Israel. He's talking to his own disciples. Because they they had a whole different mindset. Their mind was still set on the fact that we have unlimited power and we're going to go into all the world and preach the gospel. 
we're going to be somebody. But the, the real facts are, they never did get into all the world. One or two of them eventually did travel. Most of them stayed in Jerusalem. And those that travel, like Andrew and others, went places and established the Lord's work. But the message got lost. The message got lost. It is the same Jesus who talked to the apostles to go into all the world and preach the gospel. Who said to the apostle Paul when he started the revelatory work with him. That same Jesus said, Paul, if they simply believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, they shall be saved. That's why I'm always telling you that that in the 16th chapter of Acts, that's where the most explosive scripture is concerning the Old Testament. Because for the first time, when the jailer asked Paul what he must do to be saved, Paul simply said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Simple, isn't it? That's all they needed to do. Until that time, they needed to go through all sorts of different things to be saved. Jesus couldn't talk about it until the cross. But even after the cross, the kingdom message was still preached. Peter preached it, as far as we know, to his death. So did James as far as we know. But it wasn't Paul's time yet. And when Paul began to preach, he preached by this revelation that the Lord had given him. Well, let me say this. The gospel, which is the gospel for the New Testament church and for the body of Christ, church, that message came by revelation. It came by God revealing to Paul the things that should be. Revelation. Revelation knowledge. Paul didn't have to figure it out. Paul didn't argue any of the points. He was given the message of how a believer is to live and how he will be saved. He was given that message by Jesus himself but it came by revelation many in religion do not accept the apostle Paul he's a scandal to many in religion they do everything they can to destroy his message because his message is the only thing Jesus ever gave to this earth as to how they would live with Christ in them Jesus gave a lot of information to people who needed to live under the law. Somebody was talking to me, I guess it was here, somebody was telling me that their preacher was going to preach a series of messages on uh, the Beatitudes and that it's going to take several months to cover. A lot of good things there, but there's no heavier law to be found in the Scripture than the Beatitudes. What is the difference between that Jesus and the Jesus who revealed to the Apostle Paul the message of grace? It's simple. There was no law. There was no law needed because God no longer would save people on the basis of what they did. He would save people on the basis of what Christ did. Can you understand that difference? I believe you can. If you're to live in Christ, i got three things I want to tell you. One, you must have an inner relationship with Him. Your lifetime cannot be taken up with an outer relationship with Christ or the Holy Spirit or the Father. 
because you've had something to happen in you. It is Christ in you that's a hope of glory. You understand that? It's Christ in you. So something has happened to you, and you must have some sort of relationship with the Christ that is in you. What can you have? Well, one thing, you can keep your mouth closed and listen to what he said. Well, he don't talk to me. Oh, he does too. Every one of the epistles talk to you. Every one of them. There are some of them where he talks to, the, to Israel. You need to separate that. He's, you, can, you can separate that. Rightly divide it. But most of the epistles, he's talking to you. To you. Paul talks to Israel sometimes in his epistles because he was burdened for Israel. They should have had, have had this message. They should have believed this message. And his heart was touched by they who did not have it and did not accept it. You've got to have an inner relationship with Christ. It's an inside work. It's not an anointing like comes to the soul. I had a lot of anointings to come on me. They were soulish. They were not out of my spirit. They were out of the Holy Spirit. Wonderful. Like that. Loved it. But it isn't the same. The difference is that your relationship with Christ it becomes a knowing. I know in whom I have believed. I know who I am in Christ. I know Christ lives in me. It's a knowing. You'll come to that knowing. Don't argue with the Holy Spirit as to when you're going to do it. People say, well, I've prayed for that for years. Good for you. Keep it up. Keep it up. Don't ever stop. When you have a revelation that Christ is in you, you don't stop praying. You don't stop seeking God. You're more intense because you've had something that you can't feel or touch, but you know, I know Christ lives in me. It's a knowing. Oh, you'll have a lot of feeling in your soul when you come on to something fresh, new, blessed. But generally speaking, this is something that's already happened to you and it only surfaces by your knowing. Knowing who you are in Christ. Second, you need to have a flow of His life out of you with knowledge. You need to know that it's not me who lives, it's Christ who lives in me. Back to Galatians 2.20. You need to know that He lives. He's alive. Just a simple reference. If you're a mechanic, it's Christ doing the mechanic work. Get it fixed in your mind. Get the knowing there. If you're a teacher, let Christ be the teacher, using your words in your mind. If you're a preacher, by all means, let Christ have you once in a while, at least. You understand what I'm saying? Let there be a flow between you. It is not I that lives... It's Christ who lives in me. That seems like words, doesn't it? Don't let words deceive you. There are some words that need to be taken literally. No longer I that lives, Christ lives in me. And I have some kind of a flow between he and I. If we're one, if he's been joined to my spirit, there needs to be something Within me I lay hold of. So I watch my words. I watch what I think. I watch where I go. I watch who I deal with. I watch the way I deal with people. Because I want that flow between Christ and me. He's not going to come out of me like he come out of Paul. I can never be Paul. He's not going to come out of me like he comes out of Billy Graham or like he comes out of Martin Luther or some great 
person. He's going to come out of me like God created me. But I need a flow between him. He's going to come out of you like you are, like God made you. That's what salvation is, another life in you, using you to the glory of God. So in time, there'll be less of you and more that's Christ. You can't come to that stage by willingness and hard work on your part. You come to that stage by knowing. <clears throat> and it, it takes time for you to know. It doesn't happen all of a sudden. It takes time. So there'll be a vital flow between you and the Christ that lives in you. Third, you will never be free from Christ once your knowledge gets to the mind of Christ. You're stuck. <laughs> That's why some of you, when you go back to church, can't stay. Because there's a vital relationship between you and the Lord. <coughs> See, you can't listen anymore because there's a vital relationship. Abiding in Him becomes a momentary every moment relationship you don't even have that with your loved ones though that's the next thing but you don't have that with your loved ones because they're not a part of you they're not locked into you they have not been joined to your spirit and God's jealousy will never let you join anybody else to your spirit more than Christ. Because when you attempt to do it, you're in trouble. God doesn't let one of his offsprings wander away from him. Somebody said to me the other day, why are we sealed by the Holy Spirit? Because God's not going to let you out. <laughs> <coughs> That's too simple. It's because when Christ is the life and Jesus lives in you, the Holy Spirit's never going to leave you alone. He's going to be working on you till the resurrection morning. And you're going to be learning more about who you are. Not your education, not your degrees, not your intellectual training, but you're going to learn more of who you are as God's birth child. Amen. See, to come to that point, you've got to put up with this world. It's rotten, it's ugly, it's ungodly, it's full of the Antichrist. No two ways about it. If the Lord is going to send us forth in this day, He's sending us forth into a lion's den because there's nobody in this world ready to accept Christ in his fullness but there are people in trouble there are people in need who won't be able to go on unless they learn about this Christ who lives in us keep your heart open to people that are in need being a Christian is not a matter of behavior. I could spend all of my time on verses of Scripture that say you ought not to drink, you ought not to join in with the world, you ought to be a good husband, you ought to be a good wife, you ought to be a good parent, you ought to do this, you ought to do that. But what I'm doing is hitting at your fruit, not at your root. Because if it isn't Jesus, it isn't life. It's got to be Christ. One of the most often 
requested tapes we have is a set of tapes I have on it's Jesus, just Jesus. Because at that time I was struck by the fact that there is nothing else so important as Jesus. He lives in you. And I'm coming to a quitting point now. Do you realize how much God loves you? He picked you to be a container of Christ. He picked you as a place for Jesus to live where you are, what you do, what you're a part of in life. He picked you to be the place where Jesus lives. It didn't make you a Christ. It didn't make you a God. You're still your old self, but out of love. He who has already condemned and killed your self-life, waiting on you to reckon yourself dead, has allowed Christ to live in you. So I could either preach you getting right with God every day or preach to you that you need to learn about Christ who lives in you. Learning. Take some time to learn it. If people would take just a portion of the time they spend in learning computers, <laughs> which hardly anybody knows all about them yet, Anyhow, why didn't we take some time for the Lord to learn Him? Learn the Lord and you'll know who you are because He lives in you. There is no other life but His. Thank God. I have much more to say on this subject. I make notes sometimes, and I got a whole set of notes here, and I never even looked at them. <laughs> so you'll catch this message some other time, some other place. You don't know how I love you and appreciate you. How I thank God for you. I'm glad that the Lord let me come to know you. Each one of you. Because you're precious. This is an unusual group of people. We got a number of Catholic, ex Catholics here, ex Jehovah Witnesses, a room full of ex Baptists, probably, Pentecostals. Amen. Amen. <laughs> but what I really want is not an ex religionist. I'd like to have an ex-self. That would be my joy, starting with me. But we love you and thank God for you. And call these hours we've had to talk to you as precious moments. Amen? Amen. And so shall we be. Reach over and take your neighbor by the hand. You see, we always end with this little sound. Just a little sound. Take your neighbor by the hand and look him in the eye and say, I see Jesus in you. I see Jesus in you, in your life and all that you do. I see Jesus in you because I see Jesus in me. I see Jesus in me, in my life and all that I do. I see Jesus in me. 
Now hug every neck you can till we meet again in the morning, 10 o'clock.